Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, my sister's at it again. She was mad at me last week because I didn't have a single reference to her. And she said I didn't answer any of her questions. So, because of my sister, Janet, we're going to do a Q&A today. We'll get all of your questions and all your crazy friends' questions answered too. So, I'm going to try and cluster these into some, something my sister can understand. So, first of all, there's a lot of questions around, you know, herd immunity. Uh, are we reaching herd immunity? And it's really interesting to look at the peaks in the United States. So, we had this Delta peak and then this giant Omicron peak. And a lot of people got infected. I mean, there's some, some estimates that over 60% of the U.S. population got, has been infected. And in children, it's maybe as high as 75%. So yes, we're probably getting pretty close to herd immunity, which is why you're not seeing a big sp uh, spike up now, even though we've really kind of loosened all of our restrictions. Same thing worldwide. I mean, if you look at the beta A and then the beta 2, Om Omicron, the Omicron uh, peaks, uh, we're also coming down worldwide. And you know, the estimate probably is that Almost a third of the population has been infected with Omicron worldwide, and about half has been vaccinated. And so you add those up, you can see why the numbers are beginning to improve. And even there's some discussion now, are we getting out of the pandemic phase? Well, uh, we're getting close, let's put it that way. As soon as we can see sort of a low level across the world and no peaks, I'd say we're, we will be out of the pandemic phase. So another question on, uh, you know, what it, what's the latest on variants? Remember somebody asked, are we going to have more variants? Well, of course we're having more variants. As long as they're replication, we're going to have more variants. Uh, and so one of the interesting things is if you look in the United States, we were talking about Omicron and BA2 variant. Well, now BA12.1 is beginning to rise. That one looks like it's even more infectious than the previous one. But there's no evidence that, that it's actually more causing more se severe disease. So that's good. Uh, but once again, as long as we have replication of the virus, there will be variants. It does appear that um, as, these, as the virus is evolving, it's evolving to be less and less virulent, which is a good thing. That doesn't mean, as I've said before, the recombinant ones that we talked about last week, where there was a recombinant between Delta and Omicron. We don't know wh what's going on with that. Uh, and we'll just have to wait and see. There's also two other subvariants, BA4 and 5, that are similar to the first Omicron variant. That has showed up in a couple of places, but it doesn't seem to be overtaking uh, the original one. So we'll just, again, a lot of these we just have to follow and wait and see. But like always, every time it replicates, uh, it does tend to, to change. Okay, uh, when do you think we'll have a vaccine or booster designed specifically for Omicron? A uh, really good question. We've been talking about that. But what's interesting is most of the data that shows uh, vaccines specific to the variants hasn't shown that much benefit uh, in addition to the original uh, vaccine. So uh, I mentioned this uh, uh, last week that Moderna had released some data on an Omicron-specific vaccine that was done in, in monkeys and in mice. And one mouse study uh, took mice that had never been infected and then vaccinated with them. The interesting thing, it didn't really produce antibodies that were that much better than the original variant. Uh, there's been a couple of studies looking at boosters also with Omicron-specific variants. And for again, it's not 100% clear that it's better. I thought it would be better, but the data doesn't really support that. And it may be that as long as you're uh, getting an antibody to that receptor binding domain, which is a very small part of the big uh, spike protein, that it really sort of cross covers many of many of the variants. And ultimately, I hope that we'll have a, a vaccine that's very specific to just the receptor binding domain. Uh, there's a question on two new vaccines, Sinopharm and Abdallah. Uh, Sinopharm is made in China. It's a purified whole killed virus. That's kind of old fashioned. That one has been, uh, is in use. And there's a Cuban made one called Abdallah, which is a purified receptor binding domain section uh, that was uh, engineered to be a three-dose vaccine. There's some results on that, and it looks like it 14-day and 28-day three-dose regimen. It looks like it's efficacious. So all of these vaccines seem to work. Um, what about the, an update on Peter Hotez's vaccine? So really good news on that. Uh, that's called Corbivax. That was developed by BioE in India, and they've established safety above 18-year-olds. But they just published uh, some data on 5 to 17-year-olds showing that it generates an equivalent immune response as those over 18. 
So that's really, really good news. It also generates a humoral B and T cell memory response. So Peter's vaccine is looking very, very promising, and it's being used widely in India, and is, it's also been licensed now to Indonesia and a few other countries. So we're very excited about, about that. And you may have heard in the news that uh, Pfizer is requ requesting emergency uh, use authority for giving uh, boosters to kids 5 to 11, and Moderna is about to ask for uh, emergency use authorization for kids between six months and five. So that's all, again, all very good news. And when you see the amount of, uh, of uh, immunity worldwide, it's looking better and better. So one person asked me, they have friends from, they come from overseas, what, what should they tell them, uh, especially for those who've come from South America, who've probably been vaccinated with Sinopharm or the Cuban vaccine. And, you know, basically the WHO uh, recommendation is if you have two vaccinations, even if they're not our, you know, mRNA vaccines, they consider that as a complete series. But if you're going to recommend a booster, I would like, I would get an mRNA vaccine booster for those who came from South America. And that's what I've been telling people. If you have two vaccines, you're vaccinated, no matter what it was, but you get, get a booster with an mRNA vaccine. So I had a, one question from uh, one of the, uh, somebody sent me in from an email. Uh, does the COVID vaccine cause tinnitus or, or ringing of the ears or make it worse? And actually, there's been some studies on this. Uh, remember, the vaccine adverse event reporting system is anyone can report any side effect. And there have been 185 million people write in various uh, uh, complaints after vaccine. So there's a lot of data on this. Uh, there's two pro publication that looked at... Um, the incidence in people who got uh, vaccination for any kind of inner ear disorder. Uh, and so one study showed that it happened in about 28 in 100 example, 28 cases in 100,000 people. But then if you look at what's the pre-pandemic, in other words, what, what's the incidence that happens without the vaccine or even before COVID, it's somewhere between 20 and 70 cases per 100,000. So it doesn't really seem to be any different from the the natural occurrence. So it doesn't seem to be related to the, to the, um, the vaccine. And then there was another study uh, in, a, in JAMA that looked at 2.6 million uh, people in, in Israel after their first dose and 2.4 million people after their second dose. And the incidence of uh, hearing loss was 61 cases per 100,000 after the first and 56 per 100,000 after the second dose. But when you look at the incidence naturally without vaccination or pre-pandemic, pre it's around 40 to 50. So it looks like there's a slight increase in sense of neural hearing loss after vaccine, but it's very, very, very small, like 10 or 15 per 100,000. So, so, you know, it's conflicting on that, but uh, it looks like there might be some if effect, but it's very, very small. So somebody asked, is there any validity in using the SARS-CoV-2 semi-quantitative antibody tests, you know, to look at immunity. So I've, I've answered this a couple of times. People are always asking. Frankly, if uh, it's very hard for the level of antibody to predict your response. Uh, it's at the very extreme. If you have no response, then that's a problem. And then that should tell your doctor you need to get boosted or get an additional shot. If you're immune compromised or taking steroids and you don't get an, a, a, an antibody response, that's a very good indication that you should get a booster. But for your average person, having relatively low or higher antibody response, it does not really predict whether or not you will be protected. Uh, if you look at the flu data, there's a lot of overlap. There are plenty of people with low antibodies who are completely protected, and and uh, you know it's rare that if you have high antibody levels that you really have a problem. But it's just not that predicted. So it's for routine use. I wouldn't I wouldn't get it. But if you're on steroids or if you're Immunocompromised, it's very important that you get that test so that you know whether you have responded to the vaccine. Uh, somebody asked about comparing the symptoms between Delta and Omicron. Well, as you know, Delta had a lot of sort of different symptoms, much more pneumonia, uh, often a loss of sense of smell and taste. That hasn't been really the case with, uh, with Omicron. So Omicron seems to be much more kind of upper respiratory uh, and, and sneezing. Uh, so somebody asked, what is the cause of this, the loss of smell with COVID? And it's really mostly with, as you know, with the uh, Delta uh, and earlier, uh, earlier strains, of, uh, or, uh, strains of the virus. And there's been a bunch of studies looking at this. And it turns out you get a fairly strong inflammatory response around the cells that uh, sense uh, smell. And it's not so much that the virus infects those cells. It's just that around those cells there's inflammation 
And so that's what seems to cause it. And there have been even some autops autopsy studies that looked at people after they passed away, and they looked specifically at the olfactory uh, parts of the, of the brain, and, it, and they can't find virus in those cells, but around the cells there's a lot of inflammation. Most of it is reversible, but there are some cases where people have had, it seems to have uh, irreversible loss of, of, of taste and smell. It hasn't happened very often, but it does happen. Uh, good question. Does the severity of COVID infection correlate to long-term effects? So I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, big VA study. The severity absolutely does cause. The more severe your COVID, the more likely you are to have long COVID. So mild COVID rarely results in, in long-term COVID. Are there any treatments for overcrime other than Tylenol and bed rest? Well, the best one is Pfizer's Paxlovid. That, that's actually very effective, can be used in high-risk people. Other than that, it's really symptomatic treatment. But Paxlovid was very, very effective in preventing uh, ex uh, progression of disease. Here's a, this is a commentary. I feel the present relaxation of COVID restrictions has abandoned caring, <laughs> abandoned caring for the health of seniors and other vulnerable uh, populations. Uh, you know, it's true. I mean, I think one of the problems is when we all say we, we, you know, our personal freedom is very important. I don't want to wear a mask. That's good for you. But the whole thing is, what about people around you who might be vulnerable? So, you know, I, I think it's a good point. Yeah, but most people are over wearing masks and social distancing. So it's very hard now uh, to, to enforce anything. Should we still be wearing masks in Harris County? Uh, well, how do, Right now, I think if you're outdoors or in groups of people, I think that if the, we're having such low levels of cases in our community right now, I don't think it's necessary indoors. But I will tell you, when I fly in an airplane, I still wear, an air, I still wear a mask. And if I was sitting in a group at, in a theater, I probably would wear a mask too. But it's up to your personal choice. Uh, is COVID data getting less, less reliable in the US because of the frequent use of home testing? Absolutely. If you're positive at home, we don't really know the cases. That's why prevalence studies are so important. A prevalence study is where we just draw your blood and see whether you've been infected, you have antibodies to show you've been infected. That's really the only way to know right now. Otherwise, we're just estimating, and since tests are done at home all the time, you know, we just don't know. Uh, and finally, how do I decide travel risk? Well, the CDC has actually helped us a little bit with this. They've, they used to, they have four levels of concern uh, and the first three levels are really based on infection rates in the last 28 days, but they're trying to make level four uh, a little bit more specific. So it has to be rapidly escalating trajectory or extremely high case counts, emergence of a new variant of concern, or healthcare infrastructure collapse. So that's how you get to level four. And so that's the new map for risk for traveling. It's like, don't go to Brazil, maybe don't go to Russia for a couple of reasons. And still, they have, they have uh, Europe as level four. But again, I told my sister to go to Italy. Janet, if you want to go to Italy, just get your fourth shot. So that's all I had for the questions. A lot of good questions. Uh, you know, I wanted to give a giant shout out this week to uh, administrators all over the country and at Baylor College of Medicine. This is their week uh, to celebrate them. We can't get anything done without administrative staff. So thank you to all the Baylor folks. And then thanks to everybody who's in the administrative world outside of Baylor. Have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week.